I'm continually impressed at the ingenuity manifested in spreadsheets, not only in the fields of information architecture and content strategy, but also the world at large. I dare anybody to name another category of software used more ubiquitously or push farther to the edge of its capabilities. Astute commentators have remarked over the years that in the software business, your main competitor is often a spreadsheet, or that a lot of products are just spreadsheets with cardboard over 80% of the buttons. This, I believe, is a testament to the robustness and versatility of the spreadsheet as a genre, the kind of robustness and versatility that you can only get from an integrated programming environment, which still other astute commentators have correctly recognized is what a spreadsheet actually is. That said, the spreadsheet, both as implementation and as paradigm, has limitations that were baked in over 40 years ago. It isn't clear how to surmount these limitations without disrupting the thing that makes a spreadsheet a spreadsheet. I'm gonna take a few minutes to go over what these limitations are and more importantly, why you would care about them and perhaps wanna do something different. First, I want to acknowledge precisely what it was the spreadsheet did. Like many great inventions, the spreadsheet is the product of laziness. In the spring of 1978, Dan Bricklin was assigned the project to model the effects of a hypothetical merger of two companies for a course at Harvard Business School. Now, you may or may not be aware that the word spreadsheet comes from the actual paper ledger sheets accountants used to perform these and similar tasks, which were characteristically spread uh, all over a desk or table. The accountant, usually junior, would pencil values into the spreadsheet with the help of an adding machine. If something changed or if they made a mistake, they would have to do it all over again. Imagine sitting up at two in the morning with the ticker tape printer screeching away, rooting out some miscalculation or other that cascades across page after page of subsequent rewrites. That is what the spreadsheet eliminated by shrinking that expanse of tedious and error-prone manual labor to a point. And what the spreadsheet did in delegating to the computer, not only the job of the arithmetic, but also preserving the structure of the system of figures, was to enable its user to ask questions that begin with, what if? What if we price our new product at this instead of at that? What if we acquire this company instead of that one? What if we tax at this rate instead of that rate? Change one number and it propagates downstream to all the others. This innovation had a number of societal effects that I don't think get fully appreciated. For one, it completely eliminated an entire category of journeyman accounting, put them all out of work. For another, it collapsed the modeling work around mergers and acquisitions, the original problem Bricklin was tasked with, from a team of people taking months to something a single person could do in an afternoon. We can indeed credit the spreadsheet for a supporting role in the M&A boom of the 1980s and its subsequent economic and ultimately political ripple effects that are still being felt today. The spreadsheet is an object lesson in how, not even a technology per se, but a design, a paradigm, a particular configuration or packaging of technology can impact culture, politics, and society as a whole. And this is the thing that I want to impress. The spreadsheet is a proposition about how to organize information. It's an incredibly durable proposition, shored up by, as Andreessen famously put it, rough consensus and running code, but it is no more than a proposition. There can be other propositions, and there are. The spreadsheet, of course, powers the bread and butter of the content strategist, the inventory. And it is in this beast of burden that we can plainly see the indelible constraints laid out by Bricklin four decades ago. Namely, that everything has to run in a two-dimensional grid like the archaic piece of paper the software emulates. A logical entity either occupies a row or it occupies a column. Laying down a value in the words of Ted Nelson bisects the universe. Hierarchical structures are hackneyed. You can feel this when trying to encode a website structure along multiple columns. And individual fields can't have more than one value. 
Data semantics are non-existent, or at least relegated to only to human consumption. There's no way for a computer to tell what a row or column is supposed to represent. Some of these deficiencies can be palliated with techniques like pivot tables and macros, but it's clear that there are structures that we want to express that a spreadsheet encodes poorly if it can even encode them at all. And this is important because we want to be able to subsequently manipulate the information we work so hard to assemble. At least I want to be able to operate programmatically on the results of a content audit. And a spreadsheet is unfortunately too muddy, too loosey-goosey an artifact to do the job. So this work probably dates back as far as a conversation I had with Rahel Bailey probably about a decade ago. It kind of went like, why the hell don't all websites and or content management systems just have a content inventory embedded into them? Something that enables a content strategist to see every piece of content on the site exhaustive and up to date in a single synoptic view, to be able to see all the links going in and out of each page, analytics, indications of freshness, and even the statistical contours of the text. To what extent is this description even happening 10 years later? You in the audience probably know better than I do. You have to work with content management systems after all. I just write content management systems, at least if you squint hard enough. My career is like a sandwich. I was a visual designer uh, in the first in the late 90s. Uh, then I somehow got into de designing and writing infrastructure code for several years. And now I'm whatever the heck this is. I've been slicing, dicing, and julianning content and data in some form or other for over 20 years. My major foray into content management was my job from 2002 through 2005, which was to design, implement, and maintain this nutty XML system for single sourcing 120 websites and their concomitant newsletters in 15 languages, a totally normal thing to do on the early aughts internet. From about 2006 onward, I've been dealing mostly with data, so I don't really have to deal with content qua content in any serious way again until I was elected to the board of the Information Architecture Institute. May they rest in peace. Being a volunteer organization, the IAI had the feature that somebody would come on, install whatever CMS they were familiar with, and then leave. By the time I got there, there were 13 different backends serving some portion or other of the organization's corpus. My goal, in my capacity as a director, and as the only person from miles around who knew how to de-Viagra, WordPress, and Drupal, was to consolidate this sprawl while practicing good information architecture. That is, without destroying anything. Now, this was a source of endless conflict during my board tenure, and I was ultimately overridden. But out of the experience came a few choice artifacts and a bunch of interesting technique. One such artifact is a data schema I designed for content inventories. The idea went something like, let's come up with a controlled vocabulary that corresponds to definitions of all the columns that you'd find in a sensible content inventory at least the ones that aren't accounted for by vocabularies that already exist. I imagine something like a file format for exchanging content inventory data that could be shared between disparate systems that attempts to address some of the limitations of spreadsheets that I mentioned. So if you don't mind, I'd like to step through it. The technology I'm using to define this specification is RDF and OWL, in other words, semantic web. Now, I know it's not the new hotness and that mainstream developers largely abandon semantic web technology during the proverbial trough of disillusionment about seven or eight years ago, but I rode that hype cycle all the way through to the slope of enlightenment and now I'm nearing that plateau of productivity if I'm not already on it. Besides, the semantic web has a few characteristics that make it ideal for this kind of thing. Number one, URLs are everywhere. RDF basically reduces to using URLs to make statements about URLs, and that is basically what we're doing when we make content inventories. Two, there are hundreds of vocabularies out there, 
already describing all sorts of things that you can patch together, multiple sources to suit your needs. And three, if you can't find a term or concept, you can define your own, which is what I did here. These kinds of artifacts are formally called ontologies, which are kind of like controlled vocabularies plus rules. Ontologies divide into classes, which organize entities, and properties, which define how the entities relate to one another. So what we're looking at here is a master graph of all of the classes and properties defined in the spec in solid lines and those that are inherited from other ontologies in dashed lines. To explain what's going on here, there were a handful of major concerns I wanted to address pertaining to content inventories and audits. I wanted to be able to talk about the editorial status of a given document and the actions to take against it, like proofreading, rewriting, archiving, etc. I wanted to be able to ascribe types to the content, which are largely taken care of by other ontologies. I also wanted to be able to record quantitative properties of documents, including counts of features like images, tables, and forms, links in, links out, and statistics about the text, which I will address separately. And finally, I wanted to be able to model audiences for documents for the purpose of doing automated partitioning of the content, which is something I will also get to later. In a lot of ways, this ontology is kind of like a shim that glues together a bunch of more versatile and comprehensive ontologies, which you may or may not have already heard of. There's Dublin Core, so if you've heard of any of these, you've heard of Dublin Core. This is the schema that defines all of the basic bibliographic metadata, like title, description, publication date, and a few dozen others. There's a bibliographic ontology, okay, so Bibbo extends Dublin Core and others with a zillion document types and additional properties like ISBN, a DOI, and a grab bag of other stuff, mainly for academic publications. Then there's SCOS, the so-called Simple Knowledge Organization System, which is an ontology for defining taxonomies, or rather, concept schemes, tags, and or thesauri. And perhaps before I really dive into the spec, I should give some guidance on how to read the examples. Again, it's using URLs to talk about URLs, always in the form subject, predicate, object, period. If you wanna make multiple statements about the same subject, then it's subject, predicate, object, semicolon, predicate object, period. If you want to have a bunch of statements that also have the same predicate, you can say subject, predicate, object, comma, object, period. The syntax can be further abridged by doing a substitution on the URLs, namely by replacing the terms with a prefix. So you can pick these to be whatever you want, but usually the authors of the respective vocabulary suggest a convention. So, Dublin Core is usually DC or DCT. The bibliographic ontology is Bibbo, and SCOS is, well, SCOS. For my content inventory vocabulary, I chose CI. So the short prefix code stands in for the long URL prefix, which, if the spec authors have their head screwed on correctly, conveniently points to the spec that defines the ontology. So this is like pretty freaking tidy. I want to address here maybe why I go through all this trouble for making controlled vocabularies into URLs, and the reason is mainly so they don't collide with each other. Let's say you're making an ontology for describing people, and you have a field called title, as in an honorific like doctor or reverend or something. Well, that's entirely different from the title of a document. So you put these terms into two different ontologies at two different URLs, and there's no way of confusing one for the other. Also, also, one other footnote. This syntax is what you would see in the exchange format and or a diagnostic readout, not something you would write by hand or even read ordinarily, but it shows everything in the above. Anyway, classes. There aren't many of them. Uh, the first is big A actions. This is just a class for defining entities that attach to documents through the CI little action property. 
This is an unambiguous machine readable way to organize a content inventory by the results of an audit. I seeded this menu with eight specific actions, but the whole point of this design is that these can be expanded. These should be pretty self-explanatory for now, but I'll be revisiting them later. The only one I want to address right here is tentative merge, which is an action to merge a document into some other document, but you haven't determined which one yet. This is in contrast to the following class, which is a refinement of the CI big A action, which is an explicit merge. This enables you to specify the target document that you want to merge a subject document into. Next, we have the document types and decorators of which there is currently only one. A class to denote that a resource is an advertisement. Conventional document types can say whether something is an article, image, or video, for instance, but it can't express what's on it. This designation is important in automated inventories for separating wheat from chaff. Finally, there is the class for describing audiences. This inherits simultaneously from the agent class, class of Dublin Core, and the concept class from SCOS, enabling us to do sophisticated reasoning over audience segments. The idea here is that you would go into your user research and establish a set of audiences for your content. You then ascribe one or more audiences to each page, and this will enable the computer to partition the content by audience and or perform an instrumented gap analysis, that is, test whether the content is fit for the audience or otherwise smoke out unseen audience segments by mining the content itself. This is probably the most ambitious and sophisticated aspect of this system, and I'm going to have to discuss it separately. On to properties, which I have grouped by function. To remind you, these are the labels for the connections between information resources, while the classes are the kind of resource. Our first grouping of properties is authorial and editorial intent. Here we come across desired outcome. Every page on a website, at least a commercial one, can be construed as having one. This property is intended to be used in conjunction with a controlled vocabulary one would tailor to the organization. Its purpose, like a lot of these properties, is to use as a machine readable handle for selecting a group of pages. The other property in this group is non-audience. Dublin Core already has an audience property, but we also need a way to explicitly assert for whom a document is not. Uh, for example, on my own site, I have a lot of technical articles, but I have audiences that are turned off when they see anything too technical. So I use this property to express that and filter the technical articles out of the main feed. The next group is the editing tasks, which we've already seen. This is the little a action that relates the document to an action object and target, which relates a merge action into a target document. The next group is interesting. It's a way to assert certain relationships between a document and a set of concepts. Again, Dublin Core defines a subject property but this is inadequate in two ways. Number one, a document can mention something without strictly being about it. And number two, a document can be about something without strictly mentioning it. So the point of this section is a richer set of relations between documents and concepts. So we have explicit mentions irrespective of subjecthood. There's depicts or otherwise describes or elucidates. There is introduces, which assumes the reader is not familiar with the concept, and its complement assumes, which, where the do, uh, document may never mention the concept, but assumes the reader understands it. And finally, there is evokes, which again, never mentions the concept, but entices the reader to think about it. The idea here is that 
Concepts related by these properties can intersect with concepts related by different properties to audiences. And from there, we can reason programmatically about which audiences will resonate with what content or otherwise prefer to avoid it. We discuss said properties in the next section. So the example here depicts statements about a news article depicting a gruesome car accident. We can imagine an audience called squeamish person who never wants to encounter anything gruesome, so we tag them as eschewing a bunch of concepts related to violence and carnage, which we conveniently borrow from DDpedia. As it turns out, these concepts, being SCOS, are related to one another, and using these relations we can get the computer to make the inference that the article about the gruesome car wreck has a non-audience of squeamish person. The idea here is that our number of distinct audiences is going to be far smaller than the number of articles, and a lot of the concepts we will be able to pluck from the trees. If you can tag a document with a concept, or if the document explicitly mentions one, the computer could potentially do it for you, and then from there it can fill in the audience, non-audience ascriptions. As such, we can define the following relations from audiences to concepts. There is aware of, that's kind of like I've heard that word before. There's a stronger form of that which is understands. There is the positive affect called values, and then finally the negative affect we, we already saw called eschews. You put all these together and what you get is a recipe for matching your audience model to your concept scheme. The final group of properties in this vocabulary is somewhat mundane. It's the set of properties that mainly describe things about links and things related to URLs that are interesting to a content strategist. The first bunch in this section is a set of relations for inventorying kinds of links from the perspective of the user. RDF is always doing this kind of thing, but these relations capture, for example, whether or not a particular reference to a URL represents an embed, like an image or a form, and include like JavaScript or CSS, or a regular link in the UI. Following these, we have a number of mechanisms for relating alternative URLs to a canonical one. We have, for example, the complementary pair alias and alias for, which enable us to point in the direction of a more durable URL to a less durable one. We also have a set of properties which were primarily conceived for the purpose of relating external URLs to persistent internal identifiers. So a big problem in web content management is dealing with the ephemerality of URLs namely the tendency for people to come along and just move things in a file hierarchy or rename them for any reason or no reason at all. And this breaks inbound links from other sites. What we want is to be able to preserve what the public facing address of a given resource was in the past so we can subsequently preserve the continuity of access to that resource. A strategy for solving this problem is to ascribe durable permanent identifiers, such as UUIDs, to web resources. But then we need a way to relate those UUIDs, or whatever permanent identifiers you choose, back to ordinary URLs. So we have two concepts to consider here. There's canonicality and the notion of a slug, that is, a single URL path segment. Every durable, not necessarily human readable identifier can be associated with a canonical slug and then other slugs that may not be necessarily canonical. Likewise, if there's some kind of path structure that we have to observe that can't be derived from a set of deterministic rules, we can ascribe a canonical URL, which is a sub-property that is it inherits the property of alias for. Finally, in this section of mundane content management metadata, we have two additional properties that don't group so well along with the others. The first is simply a Boolean value that given, uh, given resource ought to be indexed. I don't really care what indexing means here. Rather, I found that when I was testing out this technique, I wanted a way 
to signal that I didn't want a given resource to show up in feeds or index pages or whatever. So that's what that's about. And the last property, representation, it involved a way of doing a sort of hierarchical stratification of document abstractions such that we could uh, imagine an abstract meta document yoking together a bunch more concrete forms like HTML and PDF renderings of the same thing or the English and French versions of the same thing or whatever. I'm not super sure about the fate of either of these, uh, but these are the last of the properties. Following the properties are a list of statuses for marking documents. Whereas the bibliographic ontology already furnishes us with statuses like draft, accepted, rejected, forthcoming, published, unpublished, peer-reviewed, non-peer-reviewed, and legal, which I'm assuming means the document is, has been sent to the legal department, we supplement this list with empty, incomplete, incorrect, obsolete, landing, as in it's a landing page, orphan, as in there's no links coming into it, confidential, retired, as in, and unavailable, which means it's gone and you don't know what happened to it. We also have a list of prefabricated actions, which we've seen already. There's keep, split, tentative merge, update metadata, proofread, revise, rewrite, and retire. The purpose of these, again, is to tag documents so that they can be selected out of the graph. So show me all the documents that need to be proofread or something. Before I close out this tour of the content inventory ontology, though, I have one more thing to point out, and that's probably the most spreadsheet-like aspect of this entire vocabulary, the quantitative metrics. Essentially, what I wanted was a set of metrics over the content such that I could glean some information about the size and, more importantly, the shape of each page, as well as the relations of these numbers between pages. Note that I came up with this scheme around 2011, so the most modern HTML5 features like sections were not generally deployed, although frankly they still mostly aren't. The problem at the time was that there was no concept of a chapter or a section in HTML, but there was the notion of a block. You can think of a block as something that clears the line. So a paragraph is a block, so is a table and a list, but also so is any div. So I made an algorithm that kind of shakes out a reliable number of blocks along with words per block, which turns out to actually be a pretty useful metric. Given this information, you can get a sense of the contour of a document without having to read it. Uh, in addition to raw counts of characters, words, blocks, and sections, uh, we also record the minimum and maximum, median and first and third uh, quartiles of this words per block metric for each document, and this gives us enough information to construct a box plot. We also record the average and the standard deviation. This gives us a very compact way to see at a glance how long the text runs are and how much they vary in size. And finally, in addition to all these numbers, we count the number of links going out and coming into each page, along with the number of images, videos, embeds, tables, forms, scripts, and style sheets. These last few tallies were suggested to me by Lisa Maria Marquis. And one final dead last remark about this vocabulary, and that is that these statistics are mainly focused on the corpus itself, rather than user interactions with it. However, for the project I'm using this on, we did end up making a similar data structure definition for analytics. My inclination here is that different content strategists are going to want to have access to and or want to see different analytics. So a formal data structure for analytics may not make sense to enshrine in this vocabulary. Nevertheless, they are straightforward to define and can be done on a per project basis. So I've just given you a whirlwind tour of the content inventory ontology that I've been piecing together over about 10 years. Now I want to tell you how we've been using it. Again, at the end of the day, 
we're doing is making recommendations, but we're making them about the content, the nav, the metadata, the markup, the workflows, and even the migration. So since the beginning of this project, we took it on principle that we would use the actual content of the site to inform our recommendations. And you know, it's a biggish property, and so that meant we had to automate a bunch of it. And that's where I come in. My pitch was that we would just like hoover down the whole website and separate it into two piles. A pile of essentially opaque files and a hairball of metadata. Punch out the main content of each page, denude it of all its style sheets, its scripts, its navs, its headers, footers, insets, and other ancillary bits while preserving these changes across each transformation. Meanwhile, start reabsorbing structured information embedded into the page content and from other places back into the hairball. So perhaps an interlude here. Uh, I've been working with websites since the mid 90s and to me a website is just another data source. Now this particular website had the benefit of being largely deterministic not a lot of random server-side behavior and not a lot of JavaScript. So it's an entirely sensible thing to just scrape it. The question here, and this is where the vocabulary I talked about comes in, is what to do with what you scrape. I mean, you could have to put the information somewhere. Spreadsheet? I'm sure I could. And we did project some of this information into a spreadsheet for easier manipulation by hand but I have not the faintest clue how I would have shoehorned all that information into one as a sort of canonical resource. For instance, one of the problems this and many other websites exhibit is that identical content shows up at more than one URL without efforts to assert which is the canonical location. A lot of the time the pages are bit for bit identical, or if not, they can eventually be made that way. So when we scrape, we place the opaque content we download into a special storage system called a content addressable store that organizes opaque content by cryptographic fingerprint. Imagine like a file without a name, or rather the name is derived from the exact string of bytes that makes the file. So what we get out of this is an address that we can put into the other artifact, the metadata hairball, and the bonus is we collate all of the disparate URLs that point to the same literal content for free. On this project, we noticed an immediate 25% reduction in page footprint. That is to say, a quarter of the URLs were duplicates using an extension of this technique. Aside the cryptographic fingerprints have a representation as a special URI called a named identifier, and those look like this. As such, we can use these identifiers anywhere in the hairball we would use any other kind of URL. So we use the addresses generated by the fingerprints to yoke together the web URLs that point to the same literal content and then we bundle those up and stamp them with yet another permanent identifier that isn't derived from the content so we can continue to manipulate the content while preserving the relation to its location or rather locations on the web. When I say continue to manipulate, again, I mean break down and digest our snapshot of the website. For example, almost every web page on earth has an identifiable chunk that is its main content. We can address that chunk directly and lift it out of, uh, of its original page uh, while recording a relation between the before and after states. What we find when we do this is that the page footprint goes down even more because we've stripped off all of the nav and ancillary content. But then we do the same thing with the nav, punch it out of the page and replace it with a relation in the hairball. If you do this, you'll often find that they're all identical. Uh, I should note quickly that I wrote a second vocabulary for registering these transformations, though for the sake of the clock, I'll not trawl through that one in detail. Anyway, the point of all of this business is that we want to be able to, for instance, sniff test a new nav, so we just pop one on there and try it out. Or say we want to see whether a page level IA is appropriate for a page that's representative of the content that's actually on the site. Well, 
We have the entire inventory to choose from. The response is to take a snapshot of the site and rig up a teeny tiny little web app that turns this whole mess into Lego that we can play with iteratively. And then we peel off our interventions and we, we hand them to the client. So here is where I break your hearts and tell you that the closest thing I have to a shrink wrap product is a bunch of scripts and a, this content inventory vocabulary, which I showed you. But I wanna make it clear that the point of that vocabulary is to imagine an entire ecosystem of tools that can share that information. The spreadsheet I suspect is unkillable. And I don't even really want to kill it. I want to put it in context. I needed something sturdier than a spreadsheet because I was trying to do things that a spreadsheet just can't do. Namely, use an automated content inventory as the backbone of an interactive workspace for solving information architecture and content strategy related problems for clients. I can and do take that representation and transform it into a spreadsheet, but I can't go the other way around. That's because spreadsheets are ultimately for human consumption and I needed a structure that was strict enough to be directly manipulable by machine. It's frustrating to see these artifacts that people work so hard on knowing that they can't be taking that extra step into entire new universes of capability. I began this particular excursion as a small part of a larger dissatisfaction with the level of professional rigor of we who work with the web. The endless turf wars, laborious relitigations of job titles and or DTDT, obsessions with ROI and a seat at the table, hair shirt declamations of imposter syndrome, etc., I believe are emblematic of a fragmentary understanding of how the web ought to be. The most significant bifurcation, I am almost reluctant to say, is probably the one between the people who can write code and the ones who can't. Now, I'm not saying everybody should go learn to code. I'm saying if you can't and you want a particular outcome or effect, you have to wait around for somebody who can to write it for you. But if you're not even fully aware of what the medium can do, how can you even demand access to it? Especially when the developers themselves don't really know either. You take the following pervasive examples. Why does every redesign always result in a lobotomy? Why in three decades of the World Wide Web are we still severing links? Why are we not automatically recording what a renamed URL was so we can redirect it to what it currently is? Why are we not coalescing obsolete documents into current documents when we can? And why are we not issuing the correct 410 gone code when we can't? Why isn't there an inventory built into every CMS? Why aren't accessibility and internationalization still not accommodated as a matter of course? Why is access control wedded to the platform and not the organization? Why is it so hard to migrate platforms or use more than one platform at once? Why isn't everything under the sun component driven? Our tools have evolved to work within a set of expectations, but those expectations largely come from accidents that amount to the way things are. And the way things are is only a hairline through an entire expanse of the way things could be. So the question I guess I'm left with is not so much, why can't we have more powerful tools? It's why don't we have more powerful goals? Why don't we demand higher standards from our medium and then see what new tools we need to work within those higher standards? Well, to do that, we need to know what's possible. So thank you for your attention.